This lecture series celebrates our founder, Barbara Ward, who was a landmark thinker and broadcaster, author of many books, including Only One Earth. And her insights on the urgent need to bring together environmental prosperity and economic well-being would be of great value as we grapple with today's difficulties in addressing poverty and climate change. We're enormously pleased to welcome today Commissioner Hedegor to give this lecture. She'll be familiar to many of you, having been Minister for Environment and then for Energy and Climate Change in the Danish government and host, of course, of the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference last December. Before that, she was a member of parliament in Denmark and a well-known face in journalism and broadcasting. As of February of this year, she's taken up the post of Commissioner for Climate Action in the European Commission, and we'll hear more from her about the critical role Europe needs to play in future. We'll want to hear whether Europe has been sidelined as it seemed to some observers in Copenhagen, or can press forward to be in the vanguard on climate action by delivering more ambitious targets on cuts in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. Now, in the UK, we're currently watching our political parties try and forge an agreement that might enable them to form a new government. And you might think that two parties would find it relatively easy in comparison with getting agreement from more than 190, as we had in Copenhagen. But here in London, we're still waiting is it going to be blue and yellow? Is it going to be red and yellow? Who knows? Maybe by the time we leave this room, they will have stitched up a co coalition. What I have been told is that purple is the color of those who opt for electoral reform. So I'm proud that by <laughs> chance, I put on the right top this morning. The commission will speak for 25, 30 minutes, followed by a session of questions and answers from the floor. There's going to be a special session for media and journalists after that session. So if we can focus on questions from um, the non-media world. Um, and we're live streaming this event, thanks to One Climate. Um, so please, can you make sure that you've turned off your mobiles? Commissioner, we're delighted to have you come and talk to us today. Thank you very much, Camilla Tillman, for this very charming welcome, and thank you also for all of you for, for coming. I understand that there will be matters that preoccupied any British person right now, but coming from a country where we always have coalition governments, you can take it easy. It's not going to happen for the next <laughs> one hour and a half. Distinguished guests, ladies and um, gentlemen, it is a great honor to be invited uh, to give this lecture in memory of a remarkable lady, economist, environmentalist, historian, journalist, anchor, author, and advisor to governments, Barbara Ward was clearly a true polymath and one of the very first people to identify the need for sustainable development long before it was given that name. Directly and indirectly, Barbara Ward's influence has clearly been immense. And today it lives on not only through her many books, but also through the work of the International Institute for Environment and Development. And the European Commission, indeed, is pleased to be co-funding a number of IIED's activities. I hope I will not offend anyone if I here openly acknowledge that actually until I received the invitation to do this lecture, I had not heard of Barbara Ward. How come? Well, probably because I belong to the first generation that has been so privileged as to take environmental protection for granted because of pioneers like Barbara Ward. In 1971, my country, Denmark, was actually the first country to set up a ministry for the environment, or actually, as we called it at that time, the Ministry for uh, Fighting Pollution because that was exactly what it was about back in the 70s. I recall still in my childhood in Europe, 
how we saw black and gray and yellow chimneys uh, billowing smoke from, from factory, uh, open waste dumps in the countryside, filthy, untreated wastewater running into rivers and ponds. That is not sort of the sight that my children have been sort of raised to see. This is no longer the case in most of Europe of today. And that shows us how much we can actually achieve in just one generation's time. I think of this every time I have the chance to visit some of the emerging economies. For instance, some years back when in the western part of, Chongqing, uh, of, of China, when I visited Chongqing, which is the biggest city on planet Earth it is said to be, 30 some million inhabitants. And I saw Yangtze receiving the waste from all those millions of people including the waste from their chemical factories, just 80% of it going directly into the Yangtze River. I also thought of our experience in Europe when recently I drove through an Indian landscape and passed one huge landfill after the other. Things can't be changed uh, if we really want to do so. And we must do it. We have the technology, we have the know-how, but we need to hurry. When my grandmother was born in 1901, we were not even two billion people on planet Earth. My grandchildren will have to shave planet Earth, share planet Earth with nine billion other individuals. All of them wanting a fair share in the good life in modern commodities, in cooling and heating and food and mobility and all the things that we sort of think belong to, to modern life. So we really have to develop a more energy effective and more sustainable growth. Climate change is already a fact of life for many people around the world. Many of you have probably seen it. I've also seen it with my own eyes uh, as far apart in countries like Greenland, Bangladesh, and Mali. And take, for instance, Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, climate change to the women I met there is the difference between having two meals a day or maybe only one. How come? Well, because with the changing climate, the timing of the seasons is changing. Farmers in Bangladesh can no longer sow their seeds at the time they learned from their fathers and forefathers that they should sow their seeds. And when they have managed actually to sow their seeds, hoping that this time they got the timing right, it can happen that a sudden storm surge washes away the crop and with it their food and income for the next many months. To me, Bangladesh is leaving proof how climate change and sustainable development are interwoven. Or take Mali. I recall that day one and a half year back when together with the Mali environment minister, I drove up north of this immense country. I take it that he's more or less my age. And we were driving through this scenery of new desert with only some art dwarf tree poking out of the sand. And then suddenly he said, when I was a child, here used to be a very, very uh, dense forest. Again, that is also what can happen in only one generation time. So what are the consequences of that? Well, the herders from the north of Mali can no longer graze their cattle. So they move naturally south to the more fertile soils. But this is creating immense conflict because their animals often end up eating crops grown by farmers here. So what do these farmers do? Well, they move even further south, entering into the capital Bamako, where youth unemployment has already exceeded 50%. That's why, for instance, uh, the fear of people immig immigrating, uh, migrating, is part of the whole climate change equation. Or take as the last example Greenland, where the fishermen and the hunters also can no longer use the knowledge that they inherited from their forefathers. 
because the ice begins to melt earlier in the spring. The fish stocks change. It's not the fish that used to be there. They cannot sort of use the skills that they have in inherited and, and lived from as indigenous people for centuries. They can also no longer transport themselves because due to the melting ice, they cannot use the, the sledge dogs and that, of course, is an immense challenge in a country where you do not have roads and other kind of infrastructure. In short, everywhere, no matter how different the countries and the societies are, the story is basically the same. As the climate changes, things become more and more unpredictable. That we can cope with in the rich societies, uh, but it's much harder if you are a developing a country, if you're least developed countries, and of course, as always, the most vulnerable parts of the population will be hit the most. However, the changes are going to affect us all, but the developing world will bear the brunt, and particularly the poorest and least developed will feel climate change first and foremost, however unfair it is. Having seen these impacts and talked to the people affected myself, I must admit that I find it worrying that climate skepticism seems to be on the rise in some countries at least. Of course, I, I can understand how a cold winter in Europe, the climate gate affair and the error over how fast Himalayan glaciers may melt have sown doubt in some people's minds. But the fact is that neither individually nor collectively do these events affect the main conclusions reached by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, in its force assessment report three years back. Among those clear conclusions are that global warming is unequivocal and that most of the warming recorded since the mid 20th century is very likely. That is to say with more than 90% probability to be due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations from human activities. For those who demand 100% certainty before we take action, I must say that the day we have 100% certainty, it's probably, or it is, too late to start to act. And we can also still say that if the world's leading experts told us that the plane we were about to board was more than 90% likely to crash, would we then ignore that? I certainly wouldn't. And even if climate change didn't exist, the world in any case needs to become far more efficient in the ways it uses energy and other resources, if there is to be enough for 9 billion people. Even the most stubborn skepticist will have to admit that fact. And then I would also say that I think it's rather important that people can differentiate between weather and climate. Yes, it certainly has been a long, cold winter in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but actually, it was a hot summer in the southern hemisphere, which meant that globally the average sea and land temperature in January was the fourth hottest on record according to preliminary data from the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The first quarter this year was also the fourth warmest on record worldwide. And globally, this March was the hottest March ever. So, unfortunately, the scientific reality is that global warming is happening. And we know it's only getting worse as the greenhouse gas emitted over recent decades feeds through into the climate system. Some further warning, warming is already inevitable. And the IPCC projects that if we do not reduce global emissions, the average temperature will increase further by between 1.1 and as much as up to 6.4 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. The Copenhagen Accord uh, endorsed the goal of keeping global warming below two degrees compared with the temperature in pre-industrial times, and that is therefore a major step forward. This is the ceiling that much of the scientific community wants us that we must stay below if we are to have just a 50% chance of stopping climate change from reaching dangerous levels. 
levels that could see irreversible and potentially catastrophic changes in the global environment, such as the uncontrolled melting of the polar ice sheets or the Arctic tundra. That's actually one of the good results of the Copenhagen uh, meeting, the two degrees as, as our, our common ceiling. ceiling. Yet, Yet, of course, of course there, there is a, a disconnect, disconnect that, that the targets, targets that, that so far the countries have delivered do not fit with that target. target. You could say there is a disconnect between saying, A, we must stay below the ceiling, and then the B, the targets actually being delivered. Therefore, we have, of course, to work with these targets. We need to keep our level of ambition under review and be prepared to strengthen it, not least in the interest of the most vulnerable countries and communities. And the frightening reality is that on current trends, we could be at two degrees as early as 2035, only 25 years from now. Much of the scientific evidence that has emerged over the past three years suggests that the projections in the force assessment report are on the cautious side, and that is actually the worst case scenarios we are right now heading for. Do we want to be looking back in our old age, like the last inhabitant of a devastated planet in the film The Age of Stupid, and asking ourselves, why didn't we stop climate change when we had the chance? Definitely not. That means that our generation has a moral obligation to do all we can to prevent this disaster foretold. We cannot plead ignorance. We know the facts. We know we need to act. And we also do know that it is the industrialized world that must lead this action because it is we who have very largely caused the problem. This duty is reflected in the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities enshrined in the UN Climate Convention. One can see it as a form of climate justice. It is a duty Europe fully accepts, which is also why we recognize that we and other developed countries are going to have to cut our emissions by between 80 and 95% of the 1990 levels by 2050. Next year, as Europe's Commissioner for Climate Action, I will be proposing a concrete pathway to 2050. How can we, by 2050, actually become a low-carbon society all over Europe? But we must also there include an intermediate target for 2030. It's not enough just to talk about where we're going to be by 2020. For investors, for planners, for those taking different decisions, 2020 is just around the corner and we must start to be specific, where do we need to be by 2030? But simple mathematics shows that we cannot contain climate change unless also developing countries, uh, about all the major emerging economies whose emissions are increasing rapidly, they also help us combat climate change. We can easily agree that it's not fair because they did not create the problem in the first place. But it is a fact that without them also pursuing a more low carbon strategy, then we will not be able to make it as a planet. Developing countries have already overtaken the industrialized world in terms of their combined emissions, and they will be the source of the vast bulk of future growth in global emissions. Fortunately, the major developing countries acknowledge this, by associating themselves with the Copenhagen Accord, China, India, South Africa, and Brazil, among others, have endorsed the two-degree target, which at some point also will demand concrete mitigation efforts from them. The case for acting against climate change is not only scientific and moral. There are also overwhelming economic reasons. The bottom line is we cannot afford not to. You may remember the key figures from Lord Stern's review of the economics of climate change four years back. Sitting on our hands and letting climate change reach dangerous levels will, according to the Stern report, cost the world economy at least 5% of annual GDP in terms of damage, and in the worst case, perhaps as much as 20% or more. That would mean economic and social disruption 
on a scale similar to the two world wars or the Great Depression. On the contrary, the cost of taking action to prevent global warming from reaching dangerous levels is around 1% of global GDP. In other words, the benefits of strong and early action by far outweigh the economic costs. As Lord Sun puts it, tackling climate change is a pro-growth strategy for the longer term. In these strengthened economic times, cost is not a word people want to hear. But it is important to bear in mind that the cost of acting now is not money lost, but an investment that definitely will pay dividends. An investment in a world that is less likely to be in the grip of dangerous climate change, and an investment in the innovative low carbon technologies that are becoming increasingly important as new sources of more sustainable growth and new jobs. This low carbon revolution, I would call it, is well underway. In the European Union, we gave ourselves a head start back in 2007 when our leaders agreed an integrated energy and climate strategy and set our ambitious 2020-2020 targets for the year 2020. A 20% cut in emissions, a 20% share for renewables, and a 20% improved energy efficiency. These targets are now being implemented through the climate and energy package that was agreed in 2008 and through our energy efficiency action plan. That was good, but the question today is whether it was and is good enough. I would strongly argue that re reaching these 2020-20 goals are not going to harm the economy on the country. Achieving the renewables target alone is forecast to create over 400,000 new jobs in net terms by 2020. And I'm in no doubt that we are here talking of very fast growing markets. Therefore, today the other major economies have also recognized the need to shift towards the low carbon economy. And in particular, the huge opportunities it creates for producers of low carbon equipment and infrastructure such as renewable energy technologies, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage, and smart grids. Plus, don't forget all the co-benefits. Cleaner air, cleaner waters, less energy dependency, increased energy security, and so on and so forth. So the global race is on. This is an excellent development in terms of fighting climate change. But it also means that we in Europe will have to work even harder to stay in the lead. Let me illustrate this with just a few numbers. The national stimulus packages aimed at countering the economic and financial crisis show this. China is undertaking the largest green investment program of all, totaling around 230 billion US dollars. In the United States, in their recovery package, they set aside 80 billion US dollars for the energy sector, energy, clean energy. By contrast, the EU and the bigger member states together, all in all, are investing only around 25 billion euros. I firmly believe that Europe needs to do more to drive our innovation and leadership forward if we are to avoid risking being left behind. That is why in the Europe 2020 strategy that the Commission proposed in February, the European Commission has put the achievement of greener, more resource efficient, low carbon growth at the heart of our vision for the EU's development over the coming decade and beyond. In other words, sustainable development. Our goal is, must be, to decouple economic growth from resource and energy use and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time enhancing Europe's competitiveness, creating new jobs, and strengthening our energy security. My ambition as Commissioner is to see Europe become the most climate-friendly region in the world, but this will require a battery of initiatives over the coming months and years to decarbonize the whole European economy. We have started 
a strategy to promote clean and efficient vehicles, standards, building requirements, significant increase in renewables, smart meters, better use of ICT, you could mention a lot of things. But the next step is an analysis of the options for scaling up our emissions reductions in 2020 from 20% to 30%. And I hope we will be able to present that analysis by the end of this month. The point of departure of this analysis is that back in 2008, the cost of reducing emissions by 20% was estimated to 70 billion euros. <clears throat> However, the crisis appears to have made it around one third cheaper to achieve this goal as emissions have been reduced due to the economic slowdown. So now, the cost of a 30% reduction would be only modestly higher than what we were prepared to pay for a 20% cost. And you can also put it in another way, the will to invest in innovation that the leaders of Europe had two years back, if they still had the same will to invest, the 70 billion, then we would always be already be able to go away between 20 to 30% to come quite high up in the 20s. The consequence of the crisis has been that we have not invested as much in innovation as we foresaw two years back, while everybody knows that due to the crisis, the need for innovation in Europe has definitely not been less. And here it is, of course, important to stress that money spent on achieving an emissions reductions are not money put down the drain. On the contrary, they would be money invested in cleaner and greener technologies in a strengthened position at the markets. So, if the shift to the low carbon economy is already underway, you could then ask me, do we then still need an international agreement? Isn't it too difficult? Why not just get it done by doing it bottom up? I must say, I'm absolutely convinced that a clear policy framework will help businesses by providing incentives and long-term signals for investors. I can just take the country I know best. I can tell you that if it had not been for the fact that Denmark had to reduce by 21% compared to uh, under the Kyoto Pro Protocol before 2012, a lot of the initiatives that we have been taking over recent years would not have been taken. When you have these ambitious targets, then you also set the policy instruments uh, accordingly. So governments must give this process a harder push through action and incentives, and in particular by putting a price on carbon, as we have done in Europe. That's basically what it's all about, to take care that there is a price. If you emit a lot, it's expensive. If you emit, l emit less, then you can profit from it. An international framework can and must allow us collectively to be more ambitious than each of us will be individually. It will enable us to strengthen the overall ambition level by reducing concerns over competitive distortions. It will reduce the cost of our collective reduction efforts and it will enable us to act faster, which evidently is crucial. But what then is the EU's vision for a global deal and what are the prospects for reaching it? Well, the Copenhagen Conference did not result in the international deal we had all hoped for, but nonetheless, the negotiations of the Copenhagen Accord ensured progress on key issues. Firstly, um, industrialized and developing countries together accepted for the first time that they share a co-responsibility and they accepted the two degrees. That was important. Secondly, the industrialized countries put money on the table, $30 billion in upstart finance over the next three years, and long term in the range of 100 billion per year by 2020. Certainly, the Copenhagen Accord contains important political guidance for the UN negotiations on MRV, measurable, reportable, verify how to measure, report and verify an agreement. Um, and there were also really progress on adaptation and forestry and other issues. And more than 120 countries have now associated themselves with the Copenhagen Accord. 
Is that then not good enough? No, I will end up by explaining why we have to continue this process. We still need a binding agreement. And the European Union would be ready to sign up for a new treaty already by Mexico at the end of this year. However, the absence of movement on domestic legislation in the US is without doubt a key obstacle to pro progress in the international negotiations. The delay of the Senate bill has been a real disappointment. And without binding commitment from the United States, it is hard to imagine that China will be willing to bring its domestic actions into an international framework. That is the fact that we are dealing with. So what can be achieved in Cancun? Well, I think that we must have the elements from the Copenhagen Accord sort of translated into the formal negotiations. That's first thing. We can also conclude we ought to be able to take decisions on forestry. We ought to be able to take decisions uh, on adaptations and hopefully also on technology. And then we must take decisions on the fast start finance or rather we must deliver on that. These elements is in itself a full plate. But let me say it very clearly. The credibility of the developed countries will be measured as to the degree on which we deliver on the short-term finances, the pledges being given in Copenhagen. And let me also say, it matters how we deliver on these pledges. I could also put it this way. Say after all the developed countries have delivered the 30 billion US dollars, that it turned out that it was all recycled money. How much political value do we think there would be in that via the developing countries? So there is a trade-off. The more we are actually delivering new, truly extra money, the higher the political value in doing so. This is a crucial area. And then finally, in one more area, progress is badly needed, the carbon market. We estimate that an ambitious and well-designed carbon market could deliver up to 38 billion euros per year. Um, in other words, about half of the total long-term financing pledged in the Copenhagen Accord. Therefore, the carbon market is essential it's also essential for driving investments in low carbon solutions and for achieving emission reductions at least cost. Putting a price on carbon gives everyone a financial incentive to emit less. In many respects, the clean development mechanism has been a success and achieved just that, with more than 2,000 projects registered now. But maybe just very briefly I would say, we need to modernize that. And we have to think much more in a sectoral approach so that we do not have sort of standalone projects all over the world, but so that we can go in and use our money and the offsetting actually to modernize whole sectors. That is one of the achievements that I would also like to see by Cancun. And then the very last thing, because you would all probably have this question, what then about the Kyoto Protocol? Will the European Union kill Kyoto. Let me say this very clearly. EU is not the problem here. EU signed up to Kyoto. We pledged under Kyoto and we have delivered, we have actually over delivered uh, to Kyoto. But first, that is not enough. Kyoto only includes obligations for 30% for those responsible for 30% of global emissions. We need others there, or we will never meet the two degrees target. And there are some weaknesses in the Kyoto Protocol that must be mended uh, if we are to continue with that. And then, that is the reason why I say, let's for Cancun focus on content first, and then if we agree there, and take the decisions and get the actions going, then we can try to find agreement on the future legal form. I think that must be the way ahead now. Before I conclude, and before I leave the, leave the UN negotiations, allow me one big sigh and a plea to negotiators. Please 
now give higher priority to substance over procedures and process. That is what we need in the negotiations, and that is what the world deserves. But although we are putting a lot of effort into the negotiations, into achieving an ambitious deal, we cannot and should not wait passively. I believe that the unprecedented global mobilization that we saw last year marks a profound shift in paradigm. Around the planet, people started realizing that we cannot continue business as usual. Nature has its limits. Its limits. We must find more intelligent ways to obtain growth so that we can get development also to the poorest and most vulnerable. In Europe, we cannot and we will not apply the Chinese approach where leaders dictate the development five years ahead and if need be, even close down production in order to reach the latest targets in the five-year plan. No, we cannot do that this way here. We need citizens in their daily life backing the efforts, taking responsibility. And we need business pulling ambitiously in the same direction. Politicians must provide the framework and get the incentive structure right, while business must provide the solutions so that each of us can adopt a lifestyle that makes it possible for the planet to accommodate peacefully 9 billion of us. And each citizen in the rich part of the world must take a personal responsibility being more conscious of how big a carbon footprint we leave behind us. Let me finish by saying this is not an anti-growth agenda. It's a green growth agenda. It's about responsible growth, the only kind of growth we can afford in our century. This link between environment and human development is in essence what Barbara Ward drew to the world's attention. In her days, the fight was against pollution and basic environmental challenges. In our days, it's about combating climate change and promoting sustainable energy use. And it is true today, as it was also true when we had to handle the challenges of the previous generation, that the longer you postpone action, the worse and the more costly it gets. In short, there is no excuse. We know the problem. We have the solutions. We know that we cannot allow ourselves just to send the bill for our comfortable life to the next generations. Therefore, let's make the next decade the decade of action, the decade of transformation of our economies, the decade where we start living up to our responsibility. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we've now got 15 minutes or so of questions, um, and I'll take uh, them in batches of three. I see Benito here, Simon, and one at the back. Oh, Jim, there. Thank you very much, uh, Benito Muller from Oxford. Commissioner, I uh, agree is, is easy, but I would like to uh, disagree with something you said. And it's about the uh, Kyoto Protocol and the EU not being the problem. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol in 2001 was saved through the leadership of the EU. There's no doubt about that, when Bush withdrew from the protocol. Uh, people said, Camilla said, in, in Copenhagen, the EU was sidelined. I believe that was largely self-inflicted through the strategy adopted in Bangkok to basically abandon the twin-track approach and to come up with something new post-Kyoto. Uh, post in my mind, I was told, I mean, I was sort of flabbergasted in, in Bangkok. Uh, yes, very quickly. I was, I was flabbergasted. Why did that happen in Bangkok? <laughs> and I would like, I mean, you, it was not on your watch, but I would like to know what your opinion was. And secondly, what is the opinion of the EU towards the twin-track approach? Thank you. Simon, Charlotte, if you... 
Thanks. I'm Simon Maxwell. I chair the Climate Change and Development Network, which is a large new DFID funded program working with leadership groups to deliver climate compatible development over the period of 2030. And I wanted to thank you for your leadership both in Copenhagen and in Brussels and your human approach to this problem, but also ask you the following question. What have you learned about multilateralism in your time in Copenhagen and now in Brussels? Uh, what makes a deal? What breaks a deal? Uh, how should we approach a new deal? And in particular, when you turn around and look behind you at your 27 member states following you in Brussels, what has to be done to make them more committed to the European agenda and to the Global Climate Change Alliance um, and to the financing, which will be additional? In the UK, you know, we have a policy that only 10% of aid can be used for climate. Uh, why can't we have that policy also at European level? And Jim. Yeah, it's uh, Jim, Jim Ski, UK Energy Research Centre, and a member of the UK's Committee on Climate Change. Uh, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for a lecture which emphasised what is possible and was basically full of hope, and I think we're, we're grateful for that. My question is about emission pathways to 2050. The scientists can tell us what sort of pathway we need to follow if we're going to have a reasonable shot at getting to two degrees globally but they can't tell us what the pathway for the EU is because that involves ethical considerations and considerations of fairness. And basically the question is what sort of principles, approaches will you be taking into account when you start developing that pathway for the EU out to 2050? Yeah, some very easy questions to answer very, very briefly. <laughs> uh, first to uh, Benito, I cannot explain to you what happened in Bangkok. I have said it publicly before and I can repeat it. I think it was unwise, and, and I simply do not understand why on earth take the risk that EU will be blamed for Kyoto when EU actually, as I said, has signed, pledged, and delivered under Kyoto. Why not like, make those who have the problem with Kyoto take the blame for that? And that's why in the communication that we sent out early March, less than one month after I, I, I had this office, uh, then I tried to correct this and say, it's fine with us, with Kyoto, provided that some of the details about surplus AAUs and LULUCF and things like that can be amended, because that's huge challenges. But the reality is others do not want to join, and that's the reality we face. But I've sort of tried to take care now that EU should not get the blame. We can have a second commitment period, no problem, but we do not want to stand there alone. We Somehow others will have to be bound in one form or the other and others will, among others, be the United States. Um, then Simon Maxwell, uh, what have I learned about multilateralism? That could be a very, very long answer, uh, I hope. Uh, but if I should do it relatively short, I would say that it's very, very difficult with, but it, it is probably impossible without. And I think many went home from Copenhagen and said, oh my God, never again that UN process. And then people found out, oh, but how then can we progress? And I learned one thing uh, up to Copenhagen and, and also today. Yes, we did not achieve everything. But if I had told you three years back, or even two years back, that all the major emitting, uh, emerging economies, they would have sort of acknowledged a co-responsibility in Copenhagen, you would have said, that's not going to happen. If I told you that the leaders of the world would accept the two degrees, and now what, more than 120 countries have accepted that, you would say no. So sometimes, I mean, I, I can look at sort of the multilateral things and say, oh my goodness, it's slow, and you can just claim to somebody there is a lack of trust, and then there is a lot of politics and that, and then, you know, the, the things get very, very, very slow. But then when I see it as a process over some years, we have come a long way. If I had told you three years back that we would have the most serious economic crisis in the world for decades, and yet in the same year, 2009, we managed to keep climate change on top of leaders' agenda, you would not have believed me. Uh, I started working with this 2004. If we had heard this in Buenos Aires in 2004, we would have said, that's not going to happen. So over time, things have developed. How to make the EU27 more committed? Well, to make a long story short, that's actually what we try to do with this communication about the 30%. Because, of course, after Copenhagen, 
some also among EU member states in some government offices around the, the Union would say, now we should only stick to our 20 percent. And definitely we should not go to 20 percent unless we are forced to in the, inter in the international negotiations. I'm just trying to say, listen, there is also a self-interest for Europe. Say as a theory that the international negotiations wouldn't move for a very long time. That does not necessarily mean that our competitors are not moving. They are moving extremely fast. China, Korea, Brazil, Mexico, they are just doing it right now. And that's why I try to argue it's also in Europe's self-interest to be as ambitious as we possibly can here or we will lag behind in the race on these uh, markets. And then uh, just finally about the emission pathways to 2030, what kind of principles? I think that basically the same that sort of have, have sort of been guiding us to this state that we have a special responsibility as uh, one of the rich, richest regions in the world, we must do more than others. And we know where we are going to be by 2050 because we have pledged that internationally. And that's why the less ambitious we are by 2020, the more steep the pathway. And that's why already now, uh, and it could be a long discussion about principles, but I think it will be a reality check to many if you sort of try to make a linear line, saying if you want to be here by 2050, then you have to be here by 2030. Uh, and it's very, very expensive not to get going now and, and take the next steps. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions I'd like to bring you from our um, web audience. One is, what's the EU strategy to make my country, the USA, do its part? There's another one, which is, how do you expect the committed quick start funds to be rolled out by whom and by when? And I'll take one more question from the audience. Julian, yeah. Yep. Oh, that was a very fine speech. Um, I was very pleased that you emphasized that the UN process is continuing, and that, of course, happens through all the UN agencies uh, who, by, by the fact that Copenhagen agreed to move forward on climate, that is a very important thing. But the, the, the visibility of the action of the, all the UN agencies is very, very low. I'm in the House of Lords in Parliament. Nobody hardly talks about it. Um, but what, uh, the other point you, you didn't mention was nuclear. Nuclear is an important part of Europe. Are you saying, uh, I listened and listened and listened in your speech, the word was not mentioned. Um, it is one of the important ways in which we're proceeding. But finally, you made a very important point about citizens. I do think that the citizens don't know how their climate and their environment is changing. And I think if we had much more, every community in Europe, as indeed farmers in Africa, they need to measure their rain, their temperature, and so on. And I think there could be a much bigger campaign in that direction. First, uh, the strategy via the United States. Uh, I think that um, Europe and many different Europe, European politicians, business people, whatever, did a lot of work when the new administration came to power in order to secure that that would be one of the sort of main issues on top of uh, the new team's agenda. Then you could say that last half of last year, there was some more or less, it was not sort of something that we agreed upon, but I think that many had the feeling that it might be counterproductive if we were bashing the Americans too much with the situation in their Senate and things like that. I mean, I mean, to be very frank, they just, just hate it. And, and it's, it's not very, it's, it's not, not helping the process forward in the Senate. Uh, and, and we know that the, uh, the, the administration is doing whatever they can to try to secure legislation. legislation. But, but I've also, also said very clearly to the Americans, Americans that if nothing, nothing comes out of that whole exercise, exercise then they will again hear very much from their European friends because we need the Americans to move on this. Now I know that they are moving and I mentioned how much they're investing in energy and so on and so forth, but still it's crucial that they get their own legislation done. It's crucial not only to us, it's crucial to the whole pattern in the international negotiations. About fast start financing, I think I mentioned that briefly in, uh, in, in my first intervention. Um, it should be rolled out now. We, I mean, in, in Europe, the finance ministers will meet next week and have an overview. It seems that already the European pledges are there, but now the next step is to make it very visible. What will this money go for? 
And how can we make sure that the money not just go where the each member state think that it's nice to spend the money, to put it that way, but also where there are some purposes that is necessary in order to, to sort of support the international negotiations. So it matters how we spend this money. And we're trying to make an overview now so that we, by the next negotiators meeting in Bonn, can put forward a, a consistent narrative that Europe is delivering. And we are also trying to have that kind of discussion with our American friends, telling them, you must also deliver, and the Japanese, you too. Uh, because, because this is the developed countries, countries as a group that will be measured whether we uh, deliver or not. Finally, on nuclear. <coughs> you are right. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. You're right, I did mention it. Sorry, I, I have to be excused. It's because I'm a day, and we are doing very well without it. <coughs> In Europe, of course, the answer is that yes, there will be nuclear, and some member states will have it, some will not. And I'm totally uh, aware of the fact that whether, whether people, people like it or not, nuclear, nuclear will have, have to be part, part of the equation for many, many years to come, and, and we will not see uh, less, less nuclear, nuclear, we will see more. However, however people, people should be aware, aware that, that it's a relatively, relatively expensive, expensive solution compared to a number of other solutions uh, that, that, that are there. But uh, I've always sort of said that that's up to the members, it's up to nations themselves to find out whether they want it or not. But if I'm in China, I could, I could not dream, dream of telling, telling them that they should not use nuclear. nuclear. They, they will have, have to use whatever uh, technology is there in, in order to get, get rid of coal, coal, for instance. And now I'll take one last question uh, for Hannah. So, um, lady in the middle there, Charlotte. Um, for Hannah Yamin, um, I just want to press you a little bit further on the US issue. At what point will the EU stop waiting for the US to enact its bill uh, uh, and move forward? Um, if, as you said very eloquently in your um, speech and as the Commission is working out, if the medicine of moving to 30% is so good, at what time will you decide to take that medicine? I think that's actually what the rest of the world is waiting for. Um, I think, you know, we do need a bit more clarity about what is it that the US has to deliver and by when in order to move forward. We waited all of last year. Uh, for the US to do something. We've waited all of the six months uh, for something to happen. And I want to press uh, you to uh, uh, s come up with something which uh, is convincing, given that you've also said that we need an international framework which is legally binding. OK. okay. Uh, can, can I just, I just mention, mention just one thing? Because you mentioned the citizens also. And I think that's crucial. There, I think we have a special challenge in Europe. Because, because Europe, Europe will actually, will actually be, be one of, of at, at least this, this part, part of Europe, will be one of the areas in the world that, that will feel climate change uh, later than others. So when I meet citizens of Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, or African countries, they know. They know something is happening. They know that rain patterns is not as it used to be. They, they feel it. Uh, and that's why this unfortunate debate, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, it has been very strong on sort of all this skepticism thing. I still believe that we have a, a case to, to make. We should not take it for granted that everybody understands what it's all about. But I also think that one way to include citizens more is to make this case that I try to make. It's not just about 450 ppm and 2 degrees and all this. It's also about where is our energy going to come from? How can we compete? How are we developing our economies? What about energy security? Things like that. So I think we have to broaden the agenda in order to sort of have, um, have, the, the, have the citizens behind us. And I think that's still very much important. Last question was on at what point will Europe stop to wait for the United States? Well, basically, I think that that was what we, what we did when we sort of did the, the package, for instance. Uh, what I'm trying to do right now is to say, why don't we now provide the knowledge, the facts and the figures, what would it take if we had to go to 30%? What would be the co cost benefits? Enhanced energy security, less cost for imported fossil fuels to Europe, enhanced air quality, it's worth billions of euros. Things like that, do these calculations to try also try to assess some of the job potential, making the case it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, while we are standing still with our 20% uh, 
uh, others are moving. What does that mean for our economies? I tried through that to sort of make us be more aware that this is not just about international negotiations. It's also about what is in our own self-interest. And then I think that people like yourself can also help us try to convey the general messages. Business can help try to, to spread the good cases. There are so many good cases there. There are so many businesses who found out, oh, we thought it would take 10 years to do this and that, but it only took us four years. We, we thought the investment would pay back within 12 years, but it did actually within five years. That kind of things must also come out. And then final, I, as I said, I went to China the week before last. I don't know how many of you will know that China already has a stock exchange for carbon. I visited that stock exchange. Well, it's a demonstration project, but it's still. Then I said, how many companies will be part of this? 70. Then I saw the list, and I mean, 70 pretty big companies, I can say. For instance, some of the major energy providers of China. And they have four demonstration projects like this. Because they said, up to Copenhagen, when we said that now we have to enhance our energy efficiency with 40 or 45 percent, now we have to find out exactly how to achieve that. And maybe, they told us, we are going to give it out as energy consumption rights per region, per province. Maybe instead we will choose per sector, or maybe it's per company. Can you imagine? That's China more or less applying the same kind of market thinking that we have here in Europe. I think Europeans should not be mistaken. Other regions are moving, and they are moving very, very fast. And I think that is one of the main arguments that also citizens must understand. Because if we stand still, we lose our front runner positions in these areas. Last year, China was the world's largest exporter of solar energy. This year, they will be, without doubt, the world's largest installer of wind energy. And I can take it sector by sector. In China, I also visited their one big factory for electrical vehicles. Don't believe that we are the world champions here in Europe on all these growing markets. And we have to do more if we have to keep our strong positions here. And that, I think, will be a compelling argument that people can understand. Not now here, we have to end and not to go into a huge discussion, but look around and see what will Europe be living from in the future. I would take it that most people would say this is one of the areas where we need to keep our strongholds or we will lack in wealth and prosperity. And uh, I admit this is not a very easy message maybe to, to sell in a 30 second in a, in a news uh, evening uh, broadcast, but I think that it is possible and to end on an encouraging note. The mobilization that we saw over the recent two years, that shows to me that it is possible to inform people and make people understand why we have to do things differently tomorrow than we used to do yesterday. Thank you. Well, thank you again very much to our speaker. Commissioner, I think you've brought bold new energy back into the climate change debate after the doldrums of the last few months. We've been very lucky, I think, to listen to your views about the way ahead and grateful for your willingness to take lots of questions. I think you've shown us clearly, too, to quote Pavan Sukhdev, that if climate change is the problem, that the green economy is the solution. And you've told us how a green economy might map out in terms of energy generation and um, efficiency. But it seems to me that the climate change is also about issues around adaptation for poor people and poor countries. And you've explained clearly the urgency of needing to translate our commitments on that front into rapid action on the funding. Clearly also, there's lots of innovation going on around the world. You've mentioned China, but there's much innovation also happening elsewhere from which we can learn, and if we don't learn, as you rightly say, we will be left behind. The Commissioner now needs to leave to talk to media and press, but those of you who are not pressed to depart 
we've got more lunch, tea, tea and coffee, coffee in the room next door. door. So, so please, please do stay behind, talk and chat. And what about government? Did you get a new government while we were here? Ah, we, we'll, we'll check, check up on that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.